Welcome back guys. In today's episode, we are going to be measuring up for our coilovers. Now the team over at H&R is going to be building a one-off coilover system for this car, but because their production happens in Germany while we're here in the United States, it means we've got to send them every bit of information that we can so that they can build this stuff properly. So I'm gonna walk you guys through that process today. We're gonna to see if we can't get some measurements, at least some base dimensions to send over so we can take those next steps and hopefully before too long, get some coilovers mounted on this car and get it back on the ground. For this episode, we're gonna start with the Model A because I wanna steal one of the H&R coilovers off of it so we can use it for mock-up purposes on the Ferrari. It's not exactly what we're gonna be using, but it's really close and should give us a good, useful baseline so we can take some measurements and get something relatively accurate. I'll also remind you guys as we get going to make sure you subscribe if you haven't yet because it really helps me out and I'm sure you guys won't wanna miss any of the upcoming episodes as we get closer and closer to actually finishing the 308. With the coilover on the workbench, I can give you guys a better look at what it is that we're actually working with here. Now, as said, this isn't exactly what we'll be using, but it's so close, it may as well be. It's a custom H&R Motorsport coilover that features an aluminum body and was built exactly to the specs that I requested for the Model A, including its overall length, its spring rate, its valving, so on and so forth. So what we need to do is spec all of those same things for the Ferrari. Now, there's a lot of small bits and pieces that we're gonna need to focus on, but what we really need to provide H&R with right this moment is the overall length of the shock that we need, how we want to spring and valve it, and what size bearings we need on each end. Now, before we actually start measuring, I'll show you guys this coilover versus the factory Ferrari unit. You can see that they're relatively similar in the way that they function, but we're gonna gain a lot of adjustability from these, and we're gonna save some weight too. I weighed the original shock and spring combo, and it came out to 13 pounds, or just shy of six kilos for everybody else in the world. On the other hand, the H&R Motorsport coilover wouldn't even tip the scale but I do know that it weighs right at four pounds or just under two kilos. So we're gonna save quite a bit of weight and a decent chunk of that is gonna be unsprung. Now to actually start measuring for our coilovers, we need to get the uprights and the control arms back on the car and they've been off for a little bit at this point. So I figured we'd run back through the process of installing them since all in all, it only takes about 60 seconds to do. The rear control arms installed, I went on to move to the front and repeated the exact same process. Now, if it's not clear why we need the control arms and uprights on, the reason is I want to measure the shock length that we need at our static ride height. I'm gonna pretend like the car is sitting on its own weight and set the suspension up where it should be once we put the car back on the ground. And it's important to note that because I'm gonna talk about lengthening and shortening shocks in comparison to the Model A coilover that I'm gonna be using as an example. I know that the Model A coilover is at full extension, but that doesn't really matter for what we're trying to do today. Now to set the car at its eventual ride height, we're just taking a rough guess at it. We're gonna be running Nitto R comps that come in at about 25 and three quarters of an inch in overall diameter. So I'll give ourselves a bit over 13 inches to the wheel arch. All right, so hopefully you guys can see everything in here. Uh, we've got our spindle turned so it's not on our way. It's not gonna affect any of what we're measuring. And then if you remember, the original coilover mounted up here in this mount. And the plan was to use this all along, but because we took this control arm mount and moved it, it used to be located about right here. We moved it towards the back of the car. And that means that if we were to come straight down, the coilover will land on the outside of the control arm and we don't want that. That's not a good way to do this. So what we're ultimately going to do is we're gonna add a new mount very similar to this right here at the meeting of these tubes where it's nice and strong and reinforced. And we're gonna come straight down with the coilover and we're gonna land it more or less right in the ditch of our upper control arm. Let me move this so you can see it a little bit better. We're gonna have a mount right between our two control arm tubes. Now, I'm gonna to try to do this one-handed and show you how this is gonna work. So let's see how it goes. So here I have an eyelet mocked up at the top. You can kind of see what's going on. It's not what will actually go in there. It's a leftover piece from the Model A build, but the coilover will come down. Right now I have it inverted. Uh, and then we need the eyelet 
in the ditch of the control arm. Now this coilover is too long, so we need to figure out how much we need to shorten it by, uh, ultimately, so that it can sit just like this. Now here in a moment, we're also gonna talk about this ball joint, because some of you guys are freaking out about it in the comments, but worry not, it's gonna be fine. So with the camera on a tripod, I can now use both hands, one to hold the shock up in place, and the other to actually take a measurement of how much shorter we actually need this thing to be. Now, this isn't an exact science because this is an adjustable coilover, and we can give or take a little bit of length. I just need to get in the ballpark. It looks to me like we wanna shave about an inch and a half off the overall length of the Model A coilover, and that should get us pretty much right where we need to be. I also want you to be able to see from this angle the fact that the coilover itself is pretty much straight up and down. It doesn't have hardly any inclination, but we'll touch more on that later. All right, now before we jump to the front, let's talk about that ball joint. So a lot of you guys have expressed some serious fears that this ball joint is not loaded correctly and that it's going to try to pull the ball joint out of its cup. And honestly, I'm inclined to agree with you, this does not look like it's set up correctly at all. But I think the fact that it's upside down is messing with your head because if we come down to the bottom and we imagine a coilover mounted to the lower control arm, it's going to be doing the exact same thing by trying to pull the ball joint out of the cup if our wheel and tire are loading this. It's a pulling force and it would be doing the same thing down here as it is up here. Now, some of you guys are gonna say, well, Mike, Look at how much bigger this ball joint is. It's meant to do that. Well, on a factory Corvette, it's the same ball joint top and bottom. So this ball joint can be loaded this way and it is loaded this way from the factory. So this is gonna be totally fine. I promise you don't need to worry about this ripping apart. It's meant to go this way. And to drive the point home, I even pulled the boot off of one of my spares so you could see just how thick the flange is on this thing. The ball joint itself is actually inserted into this housing from the back and then presumably machine welded. So there really is no fear that this thing's gonna come apart. Now we're gonna head back to the front suspension. Let's take a look. I've got the upright mounted just like we did on the rear, nothing really new here, but I do have the coilover mounted in the upper mount on this side because that's what we're gonna be using. And we can see the overall length here is actually pretty close because we're gonna be putting our coilover mount on the lower tubes, but still between them, just like we're doing on the back. So we're gonna to need to shorten this guy up just a touch, maybe about an inch, so that we can actually fit a mount here and a bolt through that hole. But overall, we're looking really good. We've got a good idea of what we wanna do for length. We're just gonna shorten this guy up. And the other thing we need to do is we need to measure what the inclination angle of this is because we have to figure out the motion ratio for the front. It's really important to know how much the wheel is moving versus how much the spring is moving because it's gonna affect what spring rates we need. We can't just take the weight of the car, subdivide it by four, figure out a percentage front and rear and then stick it in here. It won't work that way, especially because we don't have our coilover mount in line with our kingpin like a McPherson strut. So we have to take in uh, kind of this distance from here to our inner ball joints or rod ends and then the difference to the inner rod ends to the outer ball joint, whatever this delta is here and then the angle of this coilover. And with those numbers, H&R will be able to figure out exactly what our spring rates need to be when combined with our overall weight of the car and weight distribution minus our unsprung weight. We need to weigh some of these components and figure that out, but I can weigh those after the episode, to be honest with you. So last on our list is spring rate, and we need to know the weight of the car in order to solve for that. Problem is the car is not done, so we have to take a guess at it. And once this whole thing is finished, we may have to respring and revalve these coilovers, but that's okay, that's part of the process. With that said, we gotta take a guess. Now, the last time we weighed this car, it was about 1,100 pounds with no drive line in it, a lot of the suspension, the brakes removed, things like that, no interior in it, so on and so forth. I think right this moment, we're probably at about 1,800 pounds with our suspension, or at least the control arms and the uprights back on the car, the engine and transmission in place, the turbo system in, the cooling system, etc. Now I'm still feeling pretty good about landing under 2,500 pounds, and I'm gonna keep my fingers crossed that we're gonna land at sub 23. That might be optimistic, I don't know. I don't want to embarrass myself when we're done, 
but that's what I love for it to be. I'd be ecstatic if it was at that 2,300 pound weight. So for the time being, I'm gonna shoot right in the middle. We're gonna go with 2,400 pounds. We also have to take a guess at what the weight distribution of the car is gonna be, which it should be 50-50 side to side, but in terms of front and rear weight balance, I'm gonna go with a 55% rear bias. Could be wrong. Again, we might have to kind of redefine some of these numbers once we actually weigh the car, and hopefully we can do that soon. But for now, those are the numbers we're gonna go with. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that overall weight of 2,400 pounds, we're gonna split it 55, 45, and then both of those numbers 50, 50, so that we have each corner of the car loosely figured out. So we're getting close to having everything that we need. We know that the eyelets on each end of the coilover need to be 12 millimeters so that our bolts fit through them. And we know how long they need to be now that we've measured them up. We have a rough idea of what the car is gonna weigh and how that weight is gonna be distributed. So what we need now is to actually figure out what our motion ratio is, and we need to solve for our angle correction factor. Now on screen, I have a very basic diagram that's pretty similar to how our suspension set up. You'll have to ignore the fact that the control arm is curved. But to solve for our motion ratio, we simply need to find out those two measurements. D1 is the distance from our hind joint to the pivot at the bottom of the coilover, and D2 is the distance from the hind joint to our lower ball joint, or the length of our control arm. If we take D1 and divide it by D2 and then square that number, we have our motion ratio, simple as that. Now, because the rear coilover stands upright, we're pretty much done but the front sits at a 42 degree angle, which means there's a correction factor that we need to factor in. It's gonna require a much stiffer spring to support the same amount of weight. There is a formula that we can use to find out what this is, but we're gonna save ourselves a little bit of trouble and simply use a table. That correction factor is gonna be 0.75, give or take. That means if we wanted a 500 pound spring rate out at the wheel, we would need to use a 666 pound spring. Combine that with our motion ratio in the front of 0.6, and it means that we would need an 1,100 pound spring in the front. Now that is just based off of a round 500 pound number that I picked as a desired spring rate, or in this case, the wheel rate, the spring rate that's actually acting where the tire is touching the ground. Now I know that's a lot of numbers to digest, but hopefully the math makes sense and you understand where we're going. So there are a few other major factors that we have to contend with, and the two major ones are suspension frequency and the aerodynamic downforce that we're gonna produce. Now the suspension frequency is essentially the rate at which the suspension is going to be cycling. There are a few rule of thumb numbers that we can go with, but I know that H&R is gonna have a lot more experience with those numbers than I do, and I don't wanna take a guess. So I'm gonna confer with them and explain exactly what we're doing with the car so they can come up with the best suspension frequency numbers so that we can have the best possible suspension. Now, I'm also gonna to have to tell them the overall downforce that we're gonna produce because the springs need to be able to handle that and we need to spring the car appropriately for that downforce. Now, I can take a rough guess at it, but we may have to go back to the drawing board once we put the car on track and change those spring rates so the car reacts accordingly because there is a little bit of guesstimation here because we haven't wind tunnel tested the car. But overall, we are really making good progress on getting these coilovers ordered. I feel pretty good because now H&R has all the information they need to build the coilovers that I'm looking to have. So I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I know it was a lot of technical jargon and just a lot of measuring and that kind of stuff, but it's something that you might not get to see every day and it shows there is a lot of thought that goes into putting the right coilover on your car and hopefully you get an idea of what it takes to have a good suspension product versus something just off of the shelf that can fit multiple different cars all at once. We're trying to have the best tool for the job here and thankfully H&R is making that happen for us. So I'll catch you guys on Tuesday as always. Should be a lot of fabrication work because I got a lot of parts on the way and I'm feeling pretty good about it. So I'll catch you guys then. Thanks as always for the support.